you've joined us right in the middle of a series that we're doing on um, finance and giving. So before you walked in here, maybe you came here going, you know what, I've got a theory. The church is just after your money. So I'm going to pop into a church today and just see if I'm right. Please don't walk away and say, I was right. We never talk about it. We uh, very rarely touch on this subject, but it is a very, very important subject. Um, So you sort of walked in in the middle of that. So uh, please don't run away and say all they ever do is talk about Money, they don't. If you want to know what we really talk about, commit here for, say, 12 weeks and you'll get a good broad brush of what we talk about. Our main focus is the person of Jesus, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, because the rest of it uh, has impact on uh, perhaps how our world operates here, our time, space, life, and sort of what we get out of it and so on. But the story of Jesus has impact for us uh, for eternity. What we do with the cross, what we do with that message has impact for us for eternity, okay? And here's the thing. People want to sit there and say, well, how do you guys know you've never been there so you have no evidence and proof? Hey, neither have you. The person telling you has never been there either. So guess what? We're all living by faith, aren't we? Just some of us are choosing the Jesus story. That's where we place it. Some of us are choosing other things and hoping that the Jesus story ain't true. So at the end of the day, I've had enough life experience personally uh, to be unequivocally convinced of the fact that God is real Uh, and that not only is God real, but God is alive and active on planet Earth today, and he's doing things in people's lives. And anyone shares that experience, you can say amen if you want. There's about seven of us. Awesome. Okay, so uh, I'm going to get right into it today. Just to let you know, next week we've got a special guest speaker, Paul Worth, who will be speaking. Uh, The title of his message is Give or Else. Um, It's it's not. I know you're not. I'm just... We were talking about this this week, and he had a few theories that I thought, I really like that. Um, but he could get away with it, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't. But we do have a, a, a guest speaker next week, uh, Sue, where are you, Sue? Woo! Sue's going to be preaching next week, so we'll be uh, taking a break from this for a week and then we'll launch back in and we'll finish off on the other side of that, but I'm looking forward to hearing what Sue has to share with us next week. So here's what we're going to do, we're going to uh, continue on with what we've been talking about. We, we've been talking about finances, the first week we did a broad brush of why it's okay to talk about money in church, why it's okay to talk about giving and why we shouldn't shy away from it, why we shouldn't feel like uh, we're doing a discredit to the church or to God. Um, Jesus spoke a lot about money, a lot of his parables spoke about finance and money and so on. If God wants to talk about it and Jesus wanted to talk about it and God wanted the Holy Spirit to move upon people to write so much of what was talked about in here, then I think it's okay that we get cool with it, relax with it and realise that, you know, it's an important part of our world and if anything that's important to our life, anything that's a part of our world, I want it to line up with God. Is that right? I want to do every area of my world the way God wants me to, uh, not just the spiritual, supposed spiritual areas. In fact, Jesus even said, look, if I can't trust you with true riches, uh, if I can't trust you with the little, speaking of money in Luke, he said, then how can I trust you with true riches? So money isn't even true riches in God's economy, but it is necessary. So we're talking about that. Last week, we talked at the origins of the tithe. First tithe mentioned was three to six hundred years before the law was ever put in place. So when people say tithing's old covenants, old testament, we're in the age of grace, tithing's all gone when the law was gone, they don't understand the origins of the tithe. Tithing began three to six hundred years before the law was ever put in place. And we talked uh, uh, last week about three principles that we see in the initial giving of a tithe, uh, an offering to the Lord, uh, and we saw that it was done uh, uh, voluntarily. The second thing we looked at was it was done systematically. Third thing is we looked at it was done gratefully. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump completely over the entire period of the law, okay? Because we started before the law, so we're going to bypass law and go over into the New Covenant, the New Testament. We're going to have a look at those same three principles and see if we can find them in the New Covenant, in the, in the New Testament. Uh, and if we can't, then fair enough, maybe you, you, you can disregard it. But I believe that it, it, tithing and giving was instigated before law, which means when the law was done away with, it wasn't done away with. There's something about it that's still important. And I know when I say that word, you think something. It's like every other word. When, I say, when you say God to somebody, they, they, they have a picture in their head, don't they? We think in pictures, not words. When I say God, you don't see G-O-D. You've got an image. If I say Christians, you've got an image. You've got a picture. Well, it's the same thing with tithe. When I say tithe, we all got a picture. So we're working on changing that. Romans 12.2 says, be transformed by renewing your mind. Don't be conformed to what the rest of the world thinks. So that's what we're doing. We're on a bit of a journey of having our minds transformed. And again, if it doesn't line up with this, throw it out the door. We've got to make sure that we're building our life on this collection of ancient documents written over 1,600 years, uh, 20-something different authors, 
uh, three continents. It's an amazing, amazing uh, miracle. And matter of fact, if anyone says that they've never seen a miracle, hold your Bible up in front of you and look at it. That's a miracle. That book is a miracle. You study the history of it. The fact that you've got one in your possession right now, that is a miracle in itself. Amen? So, in Genesis 14, first time we see it, three to 600 years before the law, and we see that Abraham gave because he wanted to. The thing we're going to look at today is we're going to look at voluntary. We're going to look at voluntary giving. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says this. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. In other words, I'm, I'm encouraging you because God has been so great to you. Right? This is what he's saying. God has been so good to you, and because of that, I'm going to encourage you in something. And he says this. In view of God's mercy, he says, Offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. You know what we did there, singing, that's a part of worship, isn't it? We gather together and when we think about church, we go, oh, we, we, we had some worship and then we heard some preaching and then we're going to have some, uh, you know. But, but what he's saying here is that when we offer up our bodies to God, in other words, everything about our world, when we offer ourselves up to God, he says, that's actually true worship. Singing is an important part. It's an expression of worship. But do you remember Jesus made this comment, he quoted Isaiah, I think it was, and he said about the, the, uh, the Jewish leaders at the time, he said that you're, you praise me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Do you remember that statement? You, you, you praise me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. In other words, it, this worship here, if you're not worshipping here, this is irrelevant. It means nothing. He's saying it's where your heart is, it's where your life is. Your whole life is worship. Everything you do is worship. And now how do we worship God properly? Well, he says it here. He says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, every time you offer yourself up as a sacrifice to God, every time you make the decision to live life God's way, that's an act of worship. That's what he's saying. But what I want to point out here and what I want us to see here is that he says, you offer your body as a living sacrifice. You offer your own body as a living sacrifice. In other words, it's voluntary, isn't it? Nobody comes. Oh, I want you to imagine being one of those poor animals in the old covenant, right? I mean, the poor goat did nothing wrong. He's just a goat. But the owners blew it. And so they're going to take this goat and they're going to sacrifice this goat. And can you imagine that they've got to, uh, I don't know how they did it, whether they bind it up or, or whatever, but you, can you imagine the goat is kind of kicking and screaming a bit? I don't think the goat necessarily wants to be sacrificed. Amen? I think the goat is kicking and screaming a little bit. He's resisting and pushing back. But you see, he ends up being a sacrifice, not because he gave himself, but because he was given up by somebody else. Somebody else gave him up. But you fast forward here to the New Testament in the time of Jesus, and the writer's going, because God's been so good to us, here's how God operates now. God doesn't bind you and tie you up and slap you down and sacrifice you. You get the free will opportunity and the choice to offer yourself up to God. You can offer yourself up to God as a living sacrifice. And as everybody knows here, the chance God took in doing that is that a living sacrifice can jump up off that altar and run away whenever it wants to. How many of you ever jumped up off the altar and just run away? It's too difficult, God. It's too hard. Uh, I don't like it, God. I don't agree with you, creator of the universe, all-knowing one. I think you missed it here. And so we jump up off that altar and we run away. But you see, in the Old Testament, the animals never offered up themselves. They were given up. But we're called to offer ourselves up voluntarily to God. So your entire Christian life is voluntary. Your entire Christian life from start, it's voluntary. Nobody made you submit to Jesus. And once you submit to Jesus, it's not like this spirit overtakes you and makes you suddenly do everything that's good as a Christian. The Spirit doesn't jump on you and make you do everything that God wants you to do and bypass your own free will. That's not how it works. Your entire Christian life is voluntary. You can't offer up anyone else as a sacrifice, even though I'll guarantee at times you probably wanted to. Anyone ever wanted to offer somebody else up? Yeah, yeah. There's moments where I want to offer up our wives as a sacrifice. Lord, I want to, I'm going to, a living sacrifice. There she is, Lord, a living sacrifice. You can have her. It's probably the same with husbands. Anyone that's had kids, don't go there. We want to offer them up as living sacrifices. We want to offer up other things as sacrifices to God. But the thing in the New Covenant, the New Testament, is that the only thing you have the right to offer up as a sacrifice to God is yourself. 
You can offer up yourself. And it's voluntary. We get to do it. Now let's go back and have a real quick look at the very instigation of the New Testament movement that we call the church. In the beginning, we had a cooler name back in the day. We were called The Way. Yeah, see that? Isn't that cool? I'd rather be known as The Way today instead of the, the church. It's a different word. and church, The word church actually had no religious connotation whatsoever. But I just think there's something cool as, of, of being a part of The Way. Where are you going on Sunday? I'm going to hang out with The Way. I'm going to the way. This is cool, isn't it? But anyway, maybe we can bring that back. Let's bring that one back. We're going to call ourselves the way from now on. Um, so let's go back and have a look at the very beginning of the church, right? So here we go in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. So Jesus gets sacrificed. The, the disciples scatter. Eventually we find a group of 120 in an upper room and they're praying, but they're hiding in an upper room for fear of the Jews. They're afraid. Because if you connected yourself with Jesus, uh, it wasn't cool back then. It's not real cool now either, it's going back there, but it really wasn't cool back then. It could cost you your life. So they're in an upper room, and as they're praying and worshipping, it tells us that the Holy Spirit fell upon them. That's a whole new concept. I don't want to get caught up on that right now. But the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they begin to speak in other tongues, it says, or different, and people begin to hear them in other languages. And then what happens is this, that, that Peter, who had run away from Jesus, who had denied Jesus to a, to a slave girl, all of a sudden when the Holy Spirit came on him, he became a different. He just became empowered, didn't he? There was a boldness upon him there that we don't see a few chapters earlier when he's denying Jesus to a little slave girl and abusing her for daring to think that. But when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he was just filled with this confidence, this boldness. And so he stands up and he preaches this amazing sermon in Acts chapter 2. First sermon that gets preached in the New Testament church. And, and watch what happens after that. It says that those who accepted his message, this is Peter's message, those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Imagine that, 3,000 people, like a Billy Graham um, crusade. You know, you see, the, ever seen the videos and thousands are coming forward. 3,000 people come to faith. The very first message ever preached in the New Testament church after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the response is 3,000 people come to faith. Now watch what happens very next verse. It says, they, who's they? Well, it's the 3,000, isn't it? It's those individuals who just heard the message and said, you know what, I'm in. I believe this, I'm in. Watch what they did. It says that they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. In other words, when this movement called the way started, the very first thing we see right at the beginning is this is a voluntary thing. It's voluntary. They devoted themselves. Peter didn't say, right, now that you're a believer, here's what you have to do. In other words, there was a whole bunch of rules and regulations in the Old Covenant and now that you've come to Christ, he's the new rule book. See, God doesn't want us to have a rule book. When, when time came to fulfill all the Old Testament prophets, God didn't send a book down. He sent a person. He came to earth as a man, Jesus, and gave himself up. He didn't give a rule book. It's not about rules. It's not about regulations. It's about relationship with God, growing to know God, getting to know what pleases our Father, getting to know what he's into, and allowing the influence of his Spirit that he places inside of us, learning to obey those promptings and go with that and move with God as opposed to fighting against him like so many of us still do, even as believers. Who fights against God? There's still areas in my world where I, fought, I want to fight against God. And God in his grace and mercy doesn't take away my free will and make me do it. No, no, no. He still gives me the choice to voluntarily go with him or resist him. So these guys devoted themselves to things that they knew were going to help them grow in their newfound faith. But what's interesting is they devoted themselves. It was, it was voluntary. Before Jesus came, there was a bunch of things they had to do. Jesus comes, and it's almost like now there's a bunch of things they want to do. They want to do. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's almost like the fuel of religion is control, but the, the fuel of grace is, is, is volunteerism. It's, it's, it's choice. It's, it's, it's we want to do these things. There's a loving response to what God has done for us. We want to do these things. It's like my wife many years ago, uh, I think I've shared this story with you before, when we were dating, she went and bought me a... a I, I was mowing some lawns in YWAM and I was taking her out. We were going to a wedding in the evening and I come back in from uh, mowing my lawns and I had a caravan on the YWAM base there and I walked in and she's put... I knew it was her because I opened the door and on my bed is this pair of black pants, uh, slacks, weren't they, kind of thing. It wasn't jeans, I know that. They were fancy black pants and a shirt with this collar and these nice flowers. And I looked at that and I knew she was trying to tell me something. <laughs> I, I knew she was trying to say something to me because I'm a, I was a bit of a dag back then. I'm cool and trendy now, but I was a dag. So anyway, 
Long story short, I put those pants on, I put that shirt on, I rocked it like you wouldn't believe. I was probably the best looking guy at somebody else's wedding. <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know, theory. Anyway, I went along to that thing, but here's the thing. I put that stuff on out of a loving response to the fact that I knew this woman already loved me, dag and all. Because she already loved me, I was prepared to put those clothes on. If I thought I had to put those clothes on in order to get her to love me, I probably wouldn't have done it. And that's the difference between religion and relationship, religion and grace. Religion is about doing things to make God love you, to get God's affection. When you understand that God loves you as you are, the impact and the power of that realisation on you is that you you start doing things not to get the affection of God, but as a loving response to the affection of God that you already have. You start doing things out of the fact that, wow, God loves me so much. While I was still a sinner, Christ died for me and it changes my heart from I'm trying to do things to get love, to get affection, to get his attention, to get him to notice me. All of a sudden I start doing these things out of a loving response to the fact that I have his attention. He does love me. He, he cares for me. He's with me. It's a totally different way of doing life. And if your Christianity is based on trying to read Bible more and pray more and give more and all these things so that God will love you, you're not operating in grace. You're operating in religion. And you'll never be truly satisfied because religion is never satisfied. Five minutes of prayer a day has to become 10, has to become 20, has to become an hour, has to become two hours. One chapter of Bible reading a day has to become two, has to become a book, has to become a whole testament each time you sit down. It's never enough. One dollar has to be 20, has to be 100, then it has to be. There's no end to where religion will push you. There's no end to it. But when we understand God loves us as we are, where we are, that's the platform from which we begin to get the most out of and we begin to act, interact with the word of God from a place of grace. We begin to interact with our giving from a place of grace. We begin to interact with God in prayer from a place of grace. It's not about works. It's about grace. Amen? It's about grace. So New Testament faith is voluntary devotion to the will and purposes of God. It's voluntary devotion to the will and the purposes of God. I came across this story. Anyone ever heard of Pastor Paul Scanlon? He was a, he was a, a pastor in, uh, in, in Abundant Life Church in the UK. And, and I came across this story uh, he wrote in a book of an experience he had. And he tells a story about a defining moment in his ministry when he was a pastor. He met an ex-Baptist pastor who after 20 years of pastoring in the church he was pastoring in, he resigned and he went and bought a pub in England. Right? <laughs> went and bought a pub in England. So the landlord, the the guy that bought the pub, uh, Paul asked him this question. He said, what happened? Why did you leave your pastoring, your ministry? Why did you leave that to go and buy a pub? And and here's what the guy said. He said, I'd spent 20 years, and this is his words, by the way, not mine, but he said, I spent 20 years in soul-destroying ministry. Now, I dare say that this pastor probably did a few things not right himself, if that's how he felt about serving and ministering to people. But this is just what he said. I spent 20 years in, 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 in ministry, that had left both me and my wife on prescription medication. He talked about how for 20 years he tried to persuade people to get involved, but they refused. He became worn out from the huge effort required to convince, persuade, remind, and sometimes beg people to do the things which needed to be done in the church. Paul asked him what he enjoyed about being a pub owner the most, and here's what he said. He said, I love this job because my drinkers are devoted all by themselves. (laughs) I love this job. Because my drinkers are devoted all by themselves. He went on, he explained how he never had to call his absent drinkers to come back. He never had to call his customers to assure them they were missed. Nor did he have to inspire them to part with their money. He said, my drinkers come early and stay late, but in 20 years in ministry, the church did neither. Now, I think that he got a few things wrong when I, when I read where he landed. He's obviously got... But I love the principle of what he's trying to talk about there. And I remember working in Dan Murphy's, you know, and, and mate, I'll tell you what, the people... I'd have customers come in to buy something and they'd see me stacking, uh, uh, building a big display and they'd want to help me for free. And I'd have to say, no, no, you can't because of legal reasons if you, you know, stub your toes. You know. But people just wanted to get involved. They wanted to help. They wanted to serve. You go up there and you pay for something and, and there's a you know, $1.25 change. They go, oh, keep the change. Keep the change. I've never seen that in church in my whole life. I mean, fair enough, we don't sell products and that, but anyone ever put a tithe in and gone, oh, keep the change? <laughs> Rummaging around the back like my dad trying to get the change out of the offering bucket. It was too much. I need a bit back. See, religion drives us. Grace leads us. Religion enforces. Grace invites. 
Religion provides demands, grace provides opportunities for us to step into. Psalm 110 verse 3, it's a prophetic psalm speaking about uh, Jesus, uh, when Jesus would come. And here's what it says. It says, your troops will be willing on the day of battle. Your troops will be willing, speaking of the church or the way, the actual translation there literally means they'll volunteer freely. Your troops, in other words, your people, when Jesus comes, his people will volunteer freely because of grace, because of the mercy of God upon us. We'll be encouraged, encouraging ourselves and encouraging one another. In view of the mercy of God, offer yourself freely as a living sacrifice to God. Amen? So the New Testament, our life is volunteer-based. It's, it's voluntary. We're not forced to do anything. Ever heard people say, you know, come to Jesus and he'll get in the driver's seat, give him the driver's seat. I, I love the imagery of that, but I'm telling you what's not true. Jesus never takes the driver's seat. He gets in the passenger seat and says, you've got control. What I'm going to do is speak to you, I'm going to lead you, I'm going to guide you. But you have total control. If you want to steer away from the way I'm saying, do it. I mean, there'll be consequences, but you do what you want. But what I'm going to do is get involved. I'm getting in the vehicle of your life, and I'm going to start to speak to you and lead you and guide you, and I'm going to direct you. But you remain in control. You remain in control because grace is voluntary. It's voluntary. God's not make. And if anyone ever says, the Lord made me do it, God made me do it, you look them in the eye and you say, not good enough. What's your next excuse? Because God doesn't make you do nothing. He offers you invitations. He invites you, gives you opportunities, but he doesn't make you do nothing. At the end of the day, we choose it. All service to God is voluntary. Your worship is voluntary. No one can make you worship. That's why Daniel doesn't stand up here and say, you have to do this. Everybody has to. No, no, no. You, you, you worship voluntarily. If you come and clean in this place, I hope you do it voluntarily. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. Don't do it because you feel like you're being manipulated or twisted or pushed. No, no, you do it voluntarily because you see it as an act of service to the church and to the Lord, and that's why you come and do it. If you're making coffee, Leslie makes me coffee every Sunday morning at the end of service. Anyone notice? Leslie comes up with a tray of coffee. I've never once asked Leslie to do that. She just makes us a coffee and comes up. And and Leslie, if you're doing that because you feel like I'm going to get mad that you don't, no, no, no. But she doesn't. She just decided that she just wanted to voluntarily do that. And I take that coffee, and it's an act of service to the Lord. It's an act of service to the Lord. It's ministry. Now, this includes your giving. This includes your giving. So people use all kinds of of ways in the world to get you to give, don't they? Matter of fact, next time you've got a spare hour, sit in front of the TV, get a pen and paper, and I want you to write down how many different ways that people are trying to get you to give to how many different things. I mean, that's what 95% of advertising is on TV. It's basically, in a nutshell, we want your money. We want your money. We'll give you this, but you give us your money. Life will be easier if you give us your money. You need a break, give us your money. Things need to be quicker for you, give us your money. This food's better, give us your money. You, know, you need a holiday, give us... It, it's just give us, give us, give us, give us. But the truth is this. You don't have to give when it comes to God, when it comes to the King. You don't have to give, but God wants you to give. You don't have to, but God wants you to want to. God wants you to want to. Out of a loving response and a revelation of all that he's done for you, he wants you to participate so that what happened to you as you come to know God can happen to other people. He wants you to participate in giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 to 5, it says this. It says, now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know, this is Paul speaking to uh, the Corinthian church. The Corinthians, uh, uh, this is not a, a bunch of people with a Jewish background. So he speaks differently, Paul does, to, to Jewish, people with Jewish backgrounds and people with Gentile backgrounds. Gentiles were non-Jews. So he speaks differently to these guys. And here's what he says to the Corinthians. He says, uh, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. This was another group of churches. Paul I- here is, is talking about an offering that he's taking up. The, the Jews in Jerusalem were going through a famine, having a hard time. So Paul's very smart. He goes to the Gentile churches and says, I'm going to take up an offering. You guys contribute. When we give it to the Jews, the Jews will understand that you Gentiles are actually part of the body because they were still struggling with this Jewish-Gentile thing. And so Paul goes, if you all contribute, that'll be a sign to them. No, no, no. We're, we're one. We're one here. We're not a Jewish church. and a Gent- No, we're, we're just the church of God. 
And so he says, um, um, well, I want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing, uh, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. The Macedonian churches were going through a really hard time of persecution and poverty themselves, but they gave. They gave. Watch this. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, watch this, entirely on their own. Do you see that? Voluntary. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. They're like, you running up to me going, I, I beg you, I urge you, take this million dollars and do something for the Lord with it. They're urging. These guys are going, no, no, Paul, we want in on that. God's doing something. There's something about We want in on that. And so we're going to give towards that. But they were not made. They were not manipulated. They were not had their arms twisted. They weren't told they had... No, no, they wanted to do it. It was entirely on their own. It says, they urged us for the privilege of sharing in this service of the Lord's people and they exceeded our expectation. I love this. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. You want to be a generous person? You want to understand the ways of God? Give yourself first to the Lord. Give yourself first to the Lord and all this other stuff begins to make sense. When we don't give ourselves first to the Lord, yeah, there's a lot of things in Christianity that our head goes, tilt, tilt, what? Makes no sense. I mean, Paul wrote that to the Corinthians, didn't he? He said the, 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 the spiritual mind understands because the things of God are spiritually discerned. The earthly mind doesn't quite get it. So the more we line ourselves up with God, the more we give ourselves over to God, the more we begin to understand some of these things. So they decided on their own that they wanted to give. They even urgently pleaded with Paul to take this gift. It was a voluntary thing. And they called the giving a service. They called it a service, not just an offering to some people in need. See, giving is part of ministry. Giving is ministry. Giving is an important part of our, our, our service to God. It's an important part. It's an opportunity for us to get involved in things outside of what we're currently involved in practically. You ever thought about that? When, when you give your tithes and offerings here, uh, we give a certain amount to INC head office. You know why? Because by doing that, we're involved in church planting. Did you know that? Your giving goes to church planting all around the world. You may never get to go there. You may never see the faces of these people, but your giving goes to church planting. Your giving digs wells in other countries. Your giving has gone towards aiding flood victims here and even in other places around the place where there have been floods and natural disasters. Your giving, your finances, little pieces of you go to those places. Even though you are confined by time and space here, you've got a life here, a job here, you're physically called here, we can't physically go everywhere with our bodies, but we can in our giving. We can with our giving. And you're, invo you're involved in sponsoring children in Sri Lanka. Isn't that awesome? There are kids in Sri Lanka right now that are eating a meal because of the generosity of what we give here. So they're, they're, they're sitting down today having breakfast and getting up and going to school because somebody in Lismore, a group of people in Lismore, give. And because of that, we have the opportunity to get involved in things like this. We've got play and pray that happens out here. Why? Because you give. You don't give, we don't have this space. We don't have this space, we can't do some of the things we do. It just has a knock-on effect. It has a flow-on effect. We had, uh, we had 14 youth here last Sunday night, 14 kids doing a Bible study. 14 kids. I had a phone call today from another lady going, you know what, I heard that you're running a thing there, uh, my son would like to come. Is that okay? So we're going to have another kid here tonight. If you, if you, if you missed last week and you're one of those young people, uh, you can only really afford to miss one week, so that's why you scrape in. Okay? Miss two, we'll have to probably put you back and when we do it next time, you can do it. But you know what? That's made possible because of the giving of here because we don't just rock up and everything just magically appears out of thin air. Folders appear and printing's done and, and we get some pizzas put on and we've got a building to meet in for the kids so the parents feel safe dropping them off and we don't freeze to death because we've got to... Like all that stuff counts and your giving goes towards all of that stuff. We're feeding people, we're educating kids, we're planning wills. Your money is going to different places. Anyone remember that old super cheap auto gift card ad. Anyone remember that? Years ago, there was a, an ad and, and, and the little girl gave the dad, it was Christmas time, she gave the dad a, a present. He opened it up, it was a super cheap auto gift card. You remember that ad? And, and, and she, he said, what's this? And she said, it's, it's a gift card. And he stood up and he went, no, it's not. This could be spark plugs. This could be a new radiator. This could be a front fender. This could be, this could be anything. Remember that ad? It was one of my favourite ads. I thought, it's like that on Sunday. When I, when I go to church and I put my offering in my tithe, whatever, when I go and give, I look at it and I go, this is, I'm not just throwing this in there. This could be anything. 
This could be a meal for a starving child. This could be, this could be the dollar that provides whatever it is or the opportunity or the time or the place where somebody bows their knee to Jesus and goes, you know what, I need a fresh start. That's what it could be. It's not just money. There used to be a saying years ago, back in Owen's generation's time. You ever heard this? Don't throw it, sow it. You ever hear that? Don't just throw it, sow it. When we give, we're giving to something. It's not some religious ritual we do. There's a reason why, and it's going to things. It's helping build and establish the kingdom of God down here on earth. But if you're not the kind of person that gives yourself first to the Lord, none of that's going to make sense to you. None of it's going to make sense to you. Now, Paul, just like the church today, Paul actually had people who were waiting in the wings to accuse him and say to Paul, the very thing that people say about the church today, Paul's just after your money. Paul had people waiting to accuse him of this very thing too. And so in Philippians chapter 4, we get a little bit of an insight into Paul's motivation. Why was it that Paul so desperately thought this is a great thing that people get involved in giving? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 14 to 17, here's what Paul says. Paul says, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Anyone remember the few verses before that? I'm content with little, I'm content with much. Remember that passage? I've learnt the secret of contentment. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, whether I have a lot or a little, irrelevant. I can do anything with Christ by my side and with Christ with me. But then the very next verse he goes, however, it was good that you shared in my trouble. In other words, thank you for the offering you brought to me. Made my life a bit more comfortable. I could do a few, that's good. I was in need, you met it. Whether you did or not, I was going to make it. But you met my need, and he said it's very good. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire the gift. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. In other words, what Paul's saying is, look, I'll make it with or without. But you need to give because there's something that happens in your life when you become generous and give. There's something that happens in your life when you uh, come to the need of others and become generous. There's something that transpires in your world when you become this kind of a person. So Paul says, I can live without the stuff. It's not about the stuff. But I'm telling you, if you want to get in on what God's got for you, then become the kind of person that's going to give. Volunteer. I'm not twisting your arm. I'm not manipulating you saying, oh, if you don't give, I'm gonna, I mean, it's going to fall apart. You ever seen that? I've seen that on TV. Oh, if you don't give this month... Brother, our ministry will die and we won't be... It's like, uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like you're twisting my arm. I feel like you're making me feel like it's going to all be my fault. If I don't give your ministry, it's my fault. Oh, no, I better give. Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't say, oh, rot in prison if you don't give. He says, look, it doesn't matter. But having said that, he says, it's really good you did, not for my benefit, but for yours. It's going to be a benefit to you because I desire what's going to be credited to your account. Something good. He doesn't explain it all, but he does make this very clear that there's this thing called a matter of giving and receiving and that when you are a giver, that something gets credited to your account. We don't know everything about it, but we do know that much. And that sounds exciting enough for me to go, I want to be a voluntary giver. I want to give. I want to get in on whatever this thing is. Something good is going to happen to me. I want you to imagine like a stop go sign. Anyone seen those lollipop people? Stop go signs. Yeah? It's a little bit like that. I want you to imagine that, that when it comes to this area, let's say the financial area of your world, right? As in any area, pick an area. How many of you know that, that if you release forgiveness to somebody that right now you have unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment and anger towards, who would agree with me that God wants you to release forgiveness to them? Who thinks it's easy? It's not, is it? But, but, but here's the thing. You hang on to bitterness, resentment, and anger. I want you to imagine that that space of, of the blessing of forgiveness is here, but you're standing here. God wants to get into it, but you're holding the, the stop go sign at stop. God wants to get in there, but He's not going to override you. So, so He pulls up there and He stops and He waits and He waits. How many of you know what happens when you decide to release forgiveness and resentment and, and let it go? It's like you turn that sign, and you know what happens? God comes into that space. God gets involved in that space. But you hold up that stop sign. Then God stays out of that. It's voluntary. You can't hang on to bitterness, resentment and anger, but then still experience all the blessings of being free and forgiven. And It just doesn't make sense. Because if you want to hang on to things, God doesn't pry them out of your fingers. 
In other words, we, we participate through the invitations of God to let him into spaces by living a life that's obedient to what we believe he wants us to do in those areas of our world. It's the same in the financial world, same in the financial space. I can do whatever I want with my money. I can, I can take anyone's advice and do whatever I want with it, and I'm free to do that, and I will still make it into heaven. I cannot give a cent to the church, to charity. I cannot get involved in the kingdom of God any way, shape, or form, use all my money to build my own kingdom. I'll still make it to heaven. It's not a salvation issue. I'll still get there because of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. But I'll tell you what I'll struggle with is experiencing the full blessing of God in that area of my world down here on planet Earth because I'm standing there with a sign going, God, stay out. I don't want to do it your way. I don't want you in that space. I don't want you in that space. It doesn't matter what you say. Remember, you can, you can worship with your lips, but if your heart's far from him, he doesn't get in there. So God wants to get involved in that area, and the way that we let him get involved in that area is, is, is that we get into these ancient documents, we work out how it operates, and that's what we're doing over these weeks. So your giving is voluntary. I'm telling you now, I believe New Testament-wise, you give voluntarily. Now, now, here's the thing. Before we go, well, it doesn't really matter. Let me just say this. It, it says in... in uh, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, and I'll just throw this in as a bit of a side issue. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. So he became a curse for us and redeemed us from the curse. What's the curse he's talking about? Well, he's talking about, go back to Deuteronomy, right? And you remember that, 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 that God made this deal and he said, right, here's the deal. No one touched on it this morning. If you live this way, I'll bless you. You can go back in Deuteronomy and read all these wonderful blessings. You live this way, I'll bless you. What's interesting is he said, but if you don't, I'll curse you. God said that. A loving God said, I'll be the instigator of blessing, but he said, I will also be the instigator of the curses on your life. Right? Now, here's the thing. Jesus comes and dies on a cross, becomes a curse for us, and it says there that the curse of the law, we've been, been, been redeemed from the curse of the law. Right? So here's what I want to say to you. If you don't let God into that area, I don't believe that God is sitting there cursing you anymore. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. But just because you're not cursed doesn't mean that you're blessed. Just because you've been redeemed from the curse of the law, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily walking in the full blessing of God in that area. So if you didn't do everything God wanted, then he said, I'll instigate curse on your world. In other words, you don't bring all the tithes in. It is a curse. This is going to be, the consequence of it is bang. Jesus comes and redeems you from the curse of the law. So the curse is now taken away. It's the curse of the law, by the way. So it's somehow we know that this curse is wrapped up with the law. So don't go any further back than the law. But somehow in the law, there's a curse. And if you don't dot every I and cross every T, here's the negative consequences, we can call them. It's going to come upon you, but God's going to bring them on you. It says you're redeemed from the curse of the law, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're walking in the blessing. To walk in the blessings of God, we've still got to be obedient to God. To walk in the full blessing of God in an area, I've still got to walk in the way that God wants me to walk. God's not going to come along and say, I'm going to bless your financial socks off, you self-centered, selfish person who thinks about nobody else but themselves. I'm just going to bless you because you're the kind of guy I know is going to take this blessing and just put it in a box. And there's nothing I love more than seeing my money just rotting away in a tin. You know? He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. So when we walk in obedience to God, there is, it's, it's like saying to God, have access to that area of my world, Lord. And we've all experienced that in areas of our world where we open ourselves up to God. We might not be perfect, but we know that in our heart we're saying, God, I want you involved in this place. And God moves in and begins to direct our paths and move our ways and so on. But we also know there are areas where we go no to God. It's not that God doesn't want to get in there. He's just waiting for us to give him access to those areas of our world. And for many people, that's the financial part of our world as well. God wants to get involved in our financial affairs. He really does. You cannot read the New Testament and not tell me. You, actually, you cannot read Old or New Covenant, Old or New Testament. You cannot read these ancient documents and not see that whether you can explain it or, or nail it down or whatever, you cannot tell me. But you don't see a picture in there of a God who says, I want to bless you, I want to give to you, I want to use you, I want to pour something into your world, but there is a part that you play in that, and that part is called obedience. 
opening ourselves up and deciding that we're going to live life God's way. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 8. I talked about this the other day. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Now we can get caught up on what does that mean? Look, even if you don't know what it means, it says sow sparingly or reap sparingly. It gives you two options, right? So don't overcomplicate it. There's two things there. He says you either sow, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully, generously. In other words, you reap in proportion to what you give. Whatever that means, we can all agree it means something, right? It means something. You can't just ignore it. It means something. So you've got to think about what it means if we're going to interact with it. You've got to think about it. It means something. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart. We're going to talk about this in coming weeks. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. There it is again. It's voluntary. Your giving is voluntary, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful in the Greek literally means, it's, it's the word hilarious. It's where we get our modern day word hilarious from. It's like when Paul Worth walks in and puts his money in the offering plate and everybody is, <laughs> he's just so excited about doing it. A hilarious giver. God loves people that are giving. Tell me something. Have you ever been manipulated into doing something and been cheerful about it? You can't. You got one or the other. You can't be manipulated and twisting your arm and so on to do something and do it hilariously, cheerfully. Hell, you can't. That's what Paul's saying here. That God wants a cheerful gift. In other words, if you're putting a, a, a couple of bucks in the plate there or a tithe or whatever, if you give and you're, you, you're not happy about it, at least happy, if you're doing it begrudgingly, keep it. That's what he's saying. He's saying God wants cheerful givers, good attitude givers, people who realise this is an opportunity that God has given you an invitation to involve yourself financially in a bigger picture of the kingdom of God. And if you don't want the opportunity, fine, don't take it. But don't chuck it in and complain later on, oh, the church is after all my money, the church is all right. Don't do it. Keep it. When I was in YWAM, I had people that gave me offerings. And I remember writing them letters and sending it back to them because the letter would be attached with some kind of, oh, you know, I feel like... You, you. It certainly wasn't done hilariously, put it that way. <laughs> the letters made it very clear, this is just this obligation we feel like we have to do. It's like, take it back. I don't need it. Oh, God. <laughs> He's Okay. I can live with, without, whatever. I've got, I've got Jesus. This is an opportunity for you to get involved in what I'm doing in India, for example, because you're not here. But I am. And every time I go out to a village and we pray for this, but if you don't want to, don't. And then he goes on and he says this, not reluctantly, you're under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then he attaches to that, and God is able to bless you abundantly. Again, here it is. Don't get angry at me. So bountifully, reap bountifully. So sparingly, reap sparingly. Somehow within that, it's something. We don't know, you don't know what it is, that's fine, but it's something. Think about it. Then he goes on and somehow he ties this um, uh, ability, for this desire of God to bless you to this whole thing. Giving not out of compulsion, giving bountifully. And here's the thing, the result, God's able to bless you abundantly. In other words, he can get it to you. Watch this. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. In other words, God, God, you, you give voluntarily and God because, and, and, and opens the window and God will get to you because God will get to you because he knows he can then get it through you. He'll get it to you because he knows he can get it through you. That's what he's saying. God will abundantly bless you not just say so your own needs, but say so you've got enough to give to other good works as well. I mean, who doesn't want that? I want that. I want to give. I want to be generous. I want to be a part of things bigger than just myself. I want to know when I get to heaven that, 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 that some of what I earned down here, I love my family, I look after my family, do all that, but there's a space in my giving where we give because I know that it opens up a reciprocated door where God blesses me back. And the more he blesses me back, I know where it came from. I'm more enamored at God and I want to give more. And, more, and, and there's this, this giving and receiving, Paul calls it. Don't get mad at me, Paul called it that. You're the first church to get involved in giving and receiving. It seems that the act of voluntary giving is linked with God's desire to bless you abundantly. It looks like the end game is that you'll have all that you need, which includes enough to help others. And to abound in more good work. Abound in more good works. We'll finish up with this. 2 Corinthians 8, 11. Again, isn't it amazing when you, when you sit down and you look at the letters and you see how much Paul actually devoted to talking about this offering and this giving. Now the Holy Spirit could have put anything in those letters and put them together over 1,600 years. For some reason, God felt like we needed to have these things in here. God felt like we needed to have these things in here. Here's what Paul finishes up here. He says to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, 11. 
He says, now finish the work. These guys had, 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 had talked about, you know, we're going to take up an offering, we're going to give. He said, now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. In other words, what he's saying is, okay, you can sit there and make the decision, yes, I'm going to do it, but here's the thing. You've got to start at some point. You've got to actually start at some point. And this is what I want to challenge us with this morning. I want you to think about your giving. I want you to think about your giving. Whether you do or don't, it's, I'm not... Don't come and tell me about it. But I want to encourage you that in the New Testament, giving is an important part of church life. Not just for the needs of a church or the needs of a community, but it's really, really important for you too. We say we don't love money and that, that you know, money's not a problem. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. It's not money itself. Money's, money's neutral. It's how the heart perceives it and what the heart does with it. It's amazing. I know people that go, look, I, 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 um, you know, I, I want to give, but I, I won't give to my church, though. I'll give. You know one of the beautiful things about giving to your church? He, he's, and, and I know you can accuse me of whatever you want. That's fine. One of the beautiful things about giving to your local church is this. When you hand it over, you, one of the great things about, about that is you hand it over and you're out of control of it, aren't you? So many people go, no, no, no. I want to stay in control of it. That's why I don't give to my church. I only give to this and I give, but I don't give to my church. Because as soon as you let it go, you lose control of it and you're trusting the leadership of your church, I guess, and the ministries they're involved in and the movement and all that stuff. You're trusting something. But here's the thing. It's not about that. It's about you letting it go. It's a, sometimes what it, some of us need to do is just learn to lose control of it and actually trust God with that. I think that's part of the process. I think that's part of the wisdom of what Paul's saying. When you let go of that, you've lost control of it. Now you're trusting God. Now you're trusting God. And I want to challenge you. I don't know whether you give or don't. It's, it's not. But as we're looking at this thing of giving, I want you to know this, that you do not have to give. You do not have to give. We're going to keep talking. Next couple of weeks, we'll look at the other two things systematically and gratefully. But I just want to tell you right now that the basis of your giving is voluntary. It's voluntary. I believe you should give because I see biblically there's a blessing on your life. I give. My, what we give. We give to this church because we minister to by you people as well. So we give here. Because we believe in what's coming, going on here. We believe in what's going on through this place. But I'm also, I'll tell you, I'm a big believer that the blessing of God is real. And when we start to allow God into that part of our world, the blessing of God is real. Amen? But you've got to start somewhere. So my challenge is, if you haven't started, start. If you're sitting here now and you don't give it all, my challenge to you is, I don't care if it's 50 cents. Just start. Because until you start something, you can't see it to completion. You can't grow into it. Amen? Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, again, uh, God, moments of hilarious laughter and moments of whoops. God, it's all there when you talk about money. And uh, Father, we, well, we thank you, Lord, that we, we can talk about it, God. Thank you that you talk about it. And Lord, I thank you, God, that, uh, Father, everything we're talking about here is, is really, it's beneficial for us, God. Lord, there is a blessing in being generous. There's a blessing in giving. There's a blessing in realizing that we're not bound by paychecks and what employers give us, God. Our source is not our, our job. It's, 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 it's what you use, but it's bigger than that, Lord. We have a God that created heaven and earth, a God that has the, the cattle on a thousand hills. Lord, a God that doesn't need our money. You don't need it, God. But we need to give it to you to unlock that blessing, Father. So, Lord, I just pray this morning as we have lunch, as we move on, Holy Spirit, whatever you've been speaking to people's hearts, would you seal that? Would you cause them to wrestle with your word? And God, just to think about how that impacts them, Lord. I thank you this morning, Lord. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's no guilt. There's no uh, manipulation. There's nothing like that in this place. It's, it's grace, grace, grace. But we do thank you, Lord. And I do pray that you'd speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.